Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our lesson for meditation today is recorded for us in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 30, reading through chapter 5, verse 2. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. These are the words of our text. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, a few years back while traveling in China, the pastor that I was with was sitting down with uh, one of our interpreters and trying to find out what it is that annoys the Chinese about Americans, because heaven knows there's always these cultural gaps between different peoples. And so he was just wondering, so as not to make any mistakes in what you say or what you do. And after several minutes of prodding, uh, this lady said to him, well, the thing that drives us crazy is the deodorant that you Americans wear to cover up your skin odor. She said, we can smell it a mile away. You guys always use this fake stuff to cover your skin. And uh, I thought it's kind of interesting because you kind of wonder what it is they do. But you see, that's what deodorant is. Deodorant is a cover-up to masquerade smells that come out of your body. We call it body odor, don't we? You see, the diet over in China, at least in many parts, is nice natural herbs and a lot of garden vegetables. And you don't have cheeseburgers from McDonald's coming out of your pores in China. And so maybe that's one of the reasons why we masquerade our smell. Isn't that interesting? We all know that body odor can get pretty toxic, but there is something that's even more toxic than the worst body odor that you've smelled, and that is actually death. Death can become so smelly that it can actually kill you. Did you know that? Whenever you hear of these... Uh, catastrophes taking place across this world, there is always a mad rush to get the bodies out. Not just so that we can return their bodies to their loved ones, but because the smell is so toxic, it will produce disease and could cause even further death. That's why Hurricane Katrina and all that stuff, or the tsunami, or the uh, over in Haiti with, I think it was an earthquake that killed so many people, there's a mad rush to get those bodies out. And we already know that the odor starts to take place after just four days. Because Jesus, when he stood outside the tomb of his good friend Lazarus, Lazarus had been in the grave for four days, and it was Martha who protested the opening of that coffin. She said to Jesus, but Lord, by this time, it had been four days, there is a bad odor. He's been there four days. You see, everyone has a unique smell to them, don't they? Every human being. And what we eat ultimately will change the way that odor is as well. You know, the Bible uses odor as a metaphor for our sin. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet writes this about the nation of Israel. God, speaking through Isaiah, says this, nation that nation of Israel did not call on my name. Even though I said, here am I, here am I, all day long I've held up my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face. Then God says this about Israel. Such a people are smoke in my nostrils. They are a fire that keeps burning all day long. So when the Apostle Paul in our text today says um, that these sins, bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, he says these are sins that grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And you can bet 
that these are a stench in the nostrils of our God and if these sins are left unchecked, and sometimes they are, if they are not repented of, they will lead to eternal damnation. And we could go back to the earliest account in Genesis and see how anger turned into murder with Cain, can't we? And God said, sin is crouching at your door. You must master it before it murders you. And so Paul says, these sins that grieve the Holy Spirit, anger, bitterness, brawling, slander. He says, get rid of these things because they grieve the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. So now I want you to think of someone or several people in some instances who have misinterpreted you, who have uh, maybe stepped on your toes a little bit, who maybe offended you, who undermined you. Do you have the people in your mind? You probably don't have to look too far back unless you're a hermit and don't talk with people or deal with people. Might even be a parent. Might be a child, might be a brother or sister, might be a member, that might be a pastor. Might be a boss at work, might be a teacher that gave you an unfair grade just because they didn't like you. Do you have these people in your mind? Do they make you angry? Do they make you bitter? Do they make you slander, which is just reaching out and tarnishing their name? Look what the Apostle Paul says in our text today. Get rid of it. Get rid of it because what it does is it hampers the work of the Holy Spirit who's in your heart by faith. Do you think Jesus Christ was ever treated unjustly in life? His whole life was about injustice. Everyone treated him unjustly. His, parent, his mom, and, well, we don't know if Joseph was still alive, but his mom treated him unfairly on occasion. His brothers and sisters treated him unfairly. His disciples abandoned him. The Romans treated him unfairly. The Jewish religious leaders treated him. His whole life was one life, one event after another of how he was treated unjustly and unfairly. And the reason why we are to get rid of these things is because we hamper the work of God in our own lives and in the lives of others to whom we are to reach out and serve. You know, there is no coincidence. When you read through the book of Acts, when the church grew and prospered, it was because they had everything in common. They had a love for God's word. They mutually studied it together. And it says the church grew and prospered. And the opposite was true. When there was brawling and slander and bitterness and rage, guess what? The church imploded and digressed. That's what happened. You look in Revelation or just look uh, in the book of Acts. Look what happened to the church at Corinth with all of their uh, inner church problems that they had going on. The church digressed. So Paul says for the sake of Jesus Christ, get rid of these things because your faith isn't growing when you keep those things harbored in and the church won't grow either when you harbor these things inside of your heart. You see, when we fail to grasp that the living bread that came down from heaven, I'm taking you now to the gospel lesson. When we fail to grasp that he's already provided everything that we need in this life, then the consequence of failing to grasp that is you have all of these empty voids in your life that you try to fill these voids with other things. You try to fill them with uh, maybe friends, with money, with satisfaction out of your work. Okay? So if you don't realize that when the bread came down from heaven and gave you life, gave you forgiveness, gave you his love, you have everything that you possibly need. You have his going with you every day of your life. But if you fail to grasp that, then you try to fill the voids in your life by temporal things. And that's why Jesus said to them, would you stop working for food that spoils and rots? You guys are trying to find your utopia on earth and are always dissatisfied with what you have in this life. Have you ever met people who are only content when they are discontent? I mean, that's craziness, isn't it? Or people that are better off, happier when they're angry at someone? Paul says, get rid of those things. 
You're not the only one who's been misunderstood. You're not the only one who's had his toe stepped on. You're not the only one who has this feeling inside of your heart as though you've been wronged or mistreated or not listened to. In fact, the one that you call Savior, he epitomizes injustices done to him. And he is indeed our Savior, whom Paul says we are to imitate in our text today. You know, years ago, when I was living in Louisiana, we traveled to New Orleans. Whenever friends or family would come down, we'd have to take them to New Orleans and sightsee. And one of my favorite sights in New Orleans was looking in the graveyards. Have you ever been there down in New Orleans? They have these beautiful, elaborate, ornate uh, tombs, I suppose you call them, that are above ground because of the water level. And, and, and some of them you, you can read a, a, into the history of family life when you, when you would read the epitaphs and and, and uh, see the birth date and the death date. And there was this one particular stone that had no name on it, had no date on it, but it had only the word in quotations, forgiven. Like even that I thought was kind of neat because then your mind starts to wonder, did he kill someone? And he was having trouble living with that guilt? Or did he like uh, maybe abandon someone in his life and came to regret it later? And he, all he wanted anyone to know was that he was forgiven in the end his name didn't matter, his dates or hers, whatever it was, kind of makes you think. And you know, when you see the word forgiven as a status upon God's church, it's a title that we treasure in our hearts, right? Because we know that without forgiveness, we know where we would be spending our eternity. So we are enamored and overjoyed by this title, forgiven. But what also enamors us is to be forgiving. Did you know Jesus says in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, that if a man's not forgiving, he's also really not forgiven? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. We are not prepared to let go of the offenses of those who step on our toes until we come to the realization only by faith of what, our, of, of what our God really forgave inside of our hearts. And you know what he forgave? He forgave all the sins that Paul's talking about that we commit. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. You see, when we are offended, we are taught in society, offend back. When we are kicked in the shin, we are taught in society, kick them back harder. And we see that most clearly in presidential politics, don't we? Isn't that the name of the game? When you get stomped on, you better come back and stomp harder. And that's in both parties. That's what society would teach us. You give back what you get. But Jesus says, no, there's a much better way. Get rid of it. Paul says, get rid of these things because they hamper your faith. Remember now how we talked about death being the smelliest of all odors? that it gives off toxic odors that can kill you? Well, that is apparently everyone except for our Lord Jesus Christ because Paul the Apostle tells us today that his death was actually a fragrance in the nostrils of God. Now, you might recall an Old Testament prophecy that stated that God would not let his loved one see decay. Now, I don't know if the decay process takes place after the third day or when it actually takes place, but we are told in Old Testament prophecy that God would not allow his son to decay in that grave. Of course, we know that that's a prophecy of his resurrection, isn't it? The fact of the matter is, when Jesus died, the death that he died, it was a sweet-smelling, fragrant offering in the nostrils of God because of what he took on himself. He took upon himself the smell of death in every other human being and allowed him to be cursed, allowed himself to be cursed by his heavenly father. That was the game plan. That was the way in which he was going to cover up the scent that we all carry because of our sinful heart. Now that's really amazing when you stop to think about it because metaphorically speaking, Jesus becomes our deodorant in a sense, if you're understanding me. He covers up the scent that our sin gives off, right? Probably nobody knew this greater than one of the greatest sinners of the Old Testament, and that was King David. He actually uses the word covered up, 
in Psalm 32 when he says, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. King David needed some covering going on for his life of adultery, his life of murder, and all the other sins that he committed during his lifetime. You need cover up too, because without cover up, you die eternally. And so God set forth a game plan to give you the best smelling, fragrant deodorant that there is possibly, and that is Jesus Christ, so that all of your sins would be covered eternally. Now, once again, when we grasp that truth, then not only is it a divine necessity to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ and move on, but it's also a divine privilege that we as Christians actually get to share in the injustices of our Savior. That when men and women treat us unfairly, unkindly, unlovingly, unjustly, we actually, with Christ our Savior, get to accept the unfairness of the world and its persecution and get to bear up under that with great honor, knowing that it is with Christ our Savior that we do so. Paul says in our lesson today, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Remember last week, some of you, Pastor Berg was here, and he taught in Bible study afterwards how words in the Bible really do matter. When you dissect the words, they have meaning, and they change meanings of sentences. Well, this is one of those sentences where it is impacted by the meaning of the word love, because the word that Paul is using when he says, be imitators of God, when he says, um, as dearly loved children, is that Greek word agape that self-sacrificing love, that unconditional love. So actually, the way it's translated would be this. Paul says, imitate God as dearly loved children. He's actually saying, imitate God as children who have been sacrificed for. So when you're imitating God, you're actually imitating his sacrifice. You know what that means, ultimately? It means life doesn't revolve around me, myself, and I. Those of you who get married, marriage is about your spouse. It's not about you. Those of you who have children, your family is about your children and not about you. Those of you who work in the workforce, it's not about you. And you say, well, what about my boss who treats me unfairly? Yeah, go to the Bible. It says it's about him. It's still not about you. Even with those who mistreat you, it's always about the other people around us. And in church life, those of you who want to call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not about you. It's about the person sitting to the left and to the right of you. That's what Paul is saying when he's saying, imitate God. You can only imitate God when you know God. And when you know God's love, it becomes a privilege to imitate that love. May God give each of us the strength to do so. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Let us join now in confessing our common faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. They're found on page 31. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.